The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television, bringing you topics in the way mainstream media won't. BaseNet Internet Television presents As We See It with Fred Boaz and Friends. In Los Angeles, I'm Gene White. And now, to our studios in Boston. Hello again, everybody, and welcome to another exciting adventure here on As We See It. This is show number 33 being recorded on Sunday, March 11th, 2012. From Boston, Massachusetts, as Gene White just said, I'm Ed Jupin. And joining us today is the regular cast of characters, Minus One. Holly Hurley is still away. She will be back with us next Sunday. So joining us today is Jill Henley, the host of BaseNet TV's About Boston series and also co-host of our podcast, The Crashing Glass Podcast. So Jill will be joining us along with Fred Boaz in the Pocono Mountains, Larry the Lobster in Brookline, Massachusetts, and Gene White out in Los Angeles. Hello, gang. Hey, guys. Hello, Ed. Well, good evening. Or afternoon or morning, as yeah, it might well, be. Depending afternoon. Upon where you are. <laughs> and how's everybody today? And welcome aboard, Jill. Thanks for uh, filling in for Holly today. I'm so honored to be the lone the lone female ranger here today and to be filling in the huge shoes of Holly Hurley. Well, <laughs> you know, the the good, bad, or indifferent thing about it is at least you don't sound like Holly. As, as you'll see on uh, Crashing Glass when Jessica Moskowitz is actually filling in for Holly this week on your show, we have a running joke how... Jessica and Holly sound so much alike, and when you have the two of them on at the same time, you don't know who you're talking to. Uh, you don't quite sound like either of them, so that's actually a good thing. That's, that is a good thing. Feeling, Holly's I, I'm, big, I'm, feeling her I, shoes, you say she's got big feet? <laughs> I hear she wears a size 13, yes. <laughs> oh, she's kept me beat. You no, know, this is being recorded. <laughs> So anyway, uh, thanks for joining us. Well, I guess, Fred, before we get going with uh, our regular topics, we want to jump right into this week's Lobster Tales. Yes, we do. Uh, Larry's got some interesting ones. So, Larry, why don't you give us your Lobster Tales? We'll see what we, got, what we got to do this week. Okay, here we go. Number one, you can't kill yourself by holding your breath. Number two, a cockroach can live for nine days without its head before it starves to death. Number three... Starfish don't have brains. And the last one is, Americans on the average eat 18 acres of pizza a day. You know what? Before I give it over to all of you guys, I could personally relate to all four of those. So can I. <laughs> I can certainly eat that much pizza. I... Um, I, I would starve to death in, well, actually, I would starve to death in like 10 minutes if I couldn't eat. Uh, I could relate to the starfish because I don't think I have a brain. So I could actually relate to all of those. Oh, come on. So come on. <laughs> why, why don't you um, pick the first one there? Uh, well, we'll let Jill do it. Jill, pick your favorite out of those, and uh, let's get us going here. Well... I want to comment on pizza because I love pizza, <laughs> but the science part of me, the, the the former science teacher in me, wants to talk about this cockroach <laughs> and the starfish. I Aren't they about... related? <laughs> yeah. Now I think all I... four of these are related this week, actually. <laughs> I can see that a, a cockroach, it can live for nine days without its head. So what I don't understand is the basic biology here yeah, of why how you could even live without a head well it must have enough stores of energy that it doesn't it must have a brain i don't know it must have a brain that's so small that it doesn't need to like our brain or its brains in its rear end <laughs> but what about how can a starfish I know some people like that <laughs> have a brain in their rear end <laughs> So, you know, it's funny about cockroaches because they are, you know, they now we know partly why they can survive a nuclear explosion, right? Or a nuclear attack. They don't need brain, they don't need a brain. They <laughs> Yeah, and I guess they say they've been around since like the dinosaur age, they're leftovers. And they will be around long after we're gone. Yes, they will. Sure. Yeah. 
<laughs> when I was when I was a, a little girl, my father would tell me sometimes. And this is a very disturbing thing to be told when you're like a <laughs> ten year old girl that someday insects will take over the world ah. because of. And and he he wasn't saying it in a scary way, but he was just saying it in one of those like, well, you know, they're better at they they're better at breeding. They're better at moving their species forward than than the rest of us. <laughs> or look at the Planet of the Apes movies. Right. So, so what about your pizza story then? Well, the the pizza is just I think that the, the whole joke that seems that, like a lot of pizza. There's no such thing as bad pizza, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. I don't. I've had some bad pizza in my time. <laughs> You're not gonna name names. <laughs> I don't do that. But no, it, 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 you know, the thing is, it's funny. The average American eats an uh, eat average of 18 acres of pizza a day. I mean, I, I live on a, on, on, a, on a property that's a little over one acre. I'm thinking that that's covered with pizza and how much that actually is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's a lot of pizza. That's a lot of pizza. It's a lot of money for the pizza. And pizza. that's a lot of money for the pizza, sure. Exactly. Before yeah. kids got to deliver that? <laughs> <laughs> In 30 minutes or less, you don't pay for it? Yeah. So how about some of the other ones? I like the I like all of them. Actually, I think it's great. I mean, starfish not having brains. I don't know how. I mean, how is it possible for something to survive without a brain of some kind? Yeah, I need. You know what? I'm going to find that answer out. Give me a minute. <laughs> okay, we'll give you oh, a minute. Oh, research. So yeah, go ahead, Jill. You take all the time you want. And okay. anybody else want to comment on any of the other? Uh, no, I, I, I like the one about that you can't kill yourself by holding your by breath. holding that, your breath. Yeah. That's interesting. You might turn blue. Yeah, I'm just saying that that's interesting, though. It yeah, is. well, because I, I would think, not being a scientist, I would think that your natural reflexes then are going to make you exhale and take a breath. No, absolutely. Cause I, I remember when I was in the military, they were telling us that, you know, if you get into an encounter with somebody near water, take them and yourself into the water. Because once, they once they're in the water, they're underwater, the only thing they want is air. And... So that's a vital for us to breathe. It makes a lot of sense that you wouldn't be that if you cut off your own air supply, you're not going to be able to stay long enough for it really to affect you. Huh, yeah. so what did you come up with, Joe? Oh, right. Okay. Well, here I go. This is it's actually interesting. Larry the Lobster is correct. They do not have a brain made up of nerve cells like we do that control functions, but they have their entire nervous system acts like a distributed brain. So, in other words, it's not centralized, it's distributed mm -hmm. out. So they don't have like a brain in there, you know, in one place like most other organisms. Yeah, so they could lose a head and they're still going to live. I, yeah, they yeah and then they would just starve to death because they don't have a head, sure. <laughs> These are all interrelated because then the pizza really comes are. in so that you don't starve to death, right? A very good lobster but if, what, tells what if you give the What if you give a cockroach 18 acres of pizza? Yeah. <laughs> And he tries holding his breath at the same time. See, they are interrelated. They are interrelated. <laughs> a very good lobster tells this week, Larry. Yep, you uh, Larry. you win the gold star. Excellent. Very good. So what again, do we... Again, yeah. I just did a little looking in the starfish, too. Sea stars. They're the same thing. Same thing, Larry. And That's the, the sea stars, the politically correct right. word for starfish. Now, the research that I'm looking at in front of me says they do not have gills, scales, or fins like fish do, and they move quite differently from fish. Huh. That makes sense since they're different from fish. Yeah. So While fish propel themselves with their tails, sea stars have tiny tube feet to help them move along. Interesting. I've, I've, heard, I've heard that. Good. I think I've we're going to have before. to take a field trip to a uh, aquarium. <laughs> that could be very interesting. We should do it. The next, as we see it, could be, you know, I'll get together at the New England Aquarium. There you go. <laughs> or I bet Gene has be some nice aquariums out there. I was going to say, come on out here. we got Aquarium of the Pacific. Great aquarium to do that kind of research. Okay, next Sunday, field trip to Los Angeles, guys. Okay, guys, Gene. look forward to it. We'll send you the check, Gene. No problem. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Moving right along then. Fred, why don't you take us into our first topic and yeah. uh, really get things going here. Okay, moving right along, and this is from the Department of How Stupid Do People Really Have to Be. Two dozen former football players, believe it or not, are suing the NFL 
over the fact that they were never informed that the game of football involved large amounts of pushing and slamming into other players in the ground. I would have never imagined. The, yeah, right? The complaint filed third, uh, last Thursday in Miami follows a similar one filed in Atlanta earlier, earlier the same week, and it's the latest in a series of recent lawsuits against the NFL by ex-players who were forced to earn millions of dollars in a system, as they said, that involves harsh body contact between players. Oh my goodness. How stupid do you got to be? Or how litigious a society do you have to have? To well, very. To be well. able to file a lawsuit that that's that laughable, but it doesn't, you know, that doesn't get tossed out. Well, we, we know that this society will sue at anything at the drop of a hat, so that doesn't surprise me. Well, in a lawsuit that they said, that said filed on behalf of, uh, of players of ex-Miami Dolphins teammates, Patrick Rattan. See, now we're even, we're not even talking about like, uh, you know, Bomber League football here or no. something. We're talking about NFL professionals. How could an NFL professional not expect to get freaking well, hit and hammered and concussions and broken doing, bones? Their lawsuit accuses the NFL of deliberately concealing <laughs> years of evidence revealing that players regularly and deliberately tackle other players, especially players holding the ball. You know and what? I, I know a nice ballet, I, got, I know a nice ballet school that they could enter in then. I got one statement to make, and that's no shit. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry, and that's a no shit statement. I mean, two guys, a bunch of guys standing there, and every time you watch the game, they hit each other. Well, what do you call that? Not contact? I mean, these <laughs> people are ridiculous. How can they play football for that amount of time and not know that it's a contact sport? And yes, well, it people makes... are going to get hit and tackled. It makes exactly. no sense. I mean, even in flag football, you know, tag, uh, touch football, everybody jokes around and you'll end up doing tackles anyway, even in flag football. Oh, so absolutely. how do you think you could play legitimate NFL football and not get hit? I, I, outside of our infamous Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, do we think that any court would actually even rule in favor of this? Well, according to the according to the article we have, the NFL denies the charges. Well, oh, duh. Says the players' protection and comfort has long been a priority. Football has long been accused of being a contact sport. That NFL spokesperson and former swimsuit model Mar Marissa Miller. But that, that, that's a bold-faced lie. Sure, sometimes, like in baseball, players accidentally bump, and that is not the essence of football. If she goes into court with that, I'm telling you, they're going to lose. But she explained via several video uh, examples that contact in football is largely an optical illusion. I think she needs to have Optical her, illusion. Yeah, yeah tell, tell these people that are carried off the uh, field in stretchers with the neck braces that it was just an optical illusion. Yeah, yeah. really. Because, wow. But anyway, I mean, this just goes to show you that people will sue for anything. I mean, you can sue somebody for having a blue shirt on Thursday. That's right. And some, and some shice will probably take it. Because so the very end of that, that, that sort of satirical article, I guess, or, you know, that we're talking about, says that it did so, does say that Sports Illustrated recently polled former members of the, bang, of the 1983 Bengals. So some had no lasting impact from injuries, and others had some, many lasting hardship. <laughs> but they all agreed they had no, no regrets, and they also agreed that they could not remember the name of the team they'd played for. <laughs> so this was almost 30 years ago. Yeah, and it's, well, it, it's, a, it's a joke. I mean, come on, it's, this has to be one of those spoof articles and, and because it can't. It, people cannot be that stupid, but I guess they are. And you know, we know for a fact the significance of brain injuries and whatnot in sports. Uh, even looking at a different sport, look at Muhammad Ali. You know, they they say that some of his not that Parkinson's is directly related to it, but you know, he he took such a beating over the years that who's to say that it maybe didn't even trigger his Parkinson's or other neurological problems that he currently has then. So sure, you can only take so much uh, head beating. Well, it could have it could have uh, aggravated and exacerbated. It, sure. But the thing is that that's like walking into a lawsuit and saying, "Well, I didn't know I was going to get hit in boxing." Yeah. I mean, I was going to wreck my car in NASCAR. I mean, come on. Oh, well. I mean, football football has been around for so long, and now it's just coming out that they're getting hurt. You, and they're yeah, suing. Get hurt in I mean, that's game. pretty stupid, you know. That's, a, that's, that's retarded as far as I'm yeah. concerned. Well. In, fact, actually, in fact, you get a lawyer to take that, that's even worse. Well, you'll find a lawyer to take anything, you know that. Yeah. So what else do we have here? Well, we got a uh, an article that I read coming out of the Pocono record here in Pennsylvania, but it, it's, it's going to be uh, involving a lot of stuff here that 
papers, including the Pocono record, they moved to scrap a Doonesbury cartoon strip that's coming up about the old, about Texas uh, abortion law, requiring women to have an ultrasound before an abortion. A handful of newspapers say they won't run next week's series, while several others say the strips will be, uh, will move from the comics to the opinion page or the websites only. And, and is this because it's too uh, opinionated of Trudeau or whoever the heck is writing Doonesbury these days? They is it because it's problem. opinionated or because it's going to be graphically illustrated? Well, boy, the article goes on to say that the uh, it's because it has a deep, a deeply contentious subject, and they don't want it, they don't want to lose readership, is what it is. So it's there. It's an editorial standpoint. Right, right, and I can understand that, but and I, I understand them to trying to protect themselves, but they get to a point where you know Gary Trudeau has been known for years for satirical comics. That's what that's what Doonesbury is all about. It's sad. It's satire. Well, you know, that's and, I think that's these comic strips in particular. My favorite current comic strip is called Pearls Before Swine by Stefan Pastas. Over the past few days, he's had an ongoing little strip poking fun at Newt Gingrich. And just go back over the past four or five days worth of Pearls Before Swine, everybody, and you can follow it. It was blatantly making fun at Newt Gingrich. Well, yeah, I could understand that if you're a serious Newt Gingrich supporter or something, you might be offended by this. I don't see people lining up yet anyway to sue Stefan over this comic strip. So I think comic strips in general are satirical and poke fun at life in general. Well, the thing is, people forget that the original comic strips came out in the 1920s with people like Thomas Nast doing the original comic strips in the New York Times. They were meant to be satire. They were meant to poke fun or make points about political people or situations right. happening within the area. So what Gary Trudeau does is he does what – he continues the original concept of comic strips. The idea of comic books was to, that when they came out, you know, Spider-Man, Batman, all these – was to bring the, the comic strip character into the home. But the ones that are published in the newspaper, many of them are satirical and always have been. To sit there and say you're not going to run it because you might offend someone, well, you know something, if, you don't want, if, you're, not aff- if you're offended by it, don't read the strip. Or it seems like these people want these types of comic strips, or this Doonesbury in particular, on the editorial page then and call it like you know an editorial cartoon. It, it sounds like that's what one of the newspapers yeah. does. He, right, right, they run Doonesbury on their op-ed page okay. so that because that many of the readers will disagree with the political stance on there anyway, so okay. that it almost treats it like it's like a political type of cartoon, which really what Trudeau wants to do. And that's and fine. And put it on the editorial page. Yeah. yeah, he's good at it. I mean, he's good at bringing issues to light that are controversial and that really need to. I mean, that's the whole point of our freedom of press, right? That we. Larry are, the Lobster, what do you think? You read like 18,000 comic strips a day. Do you read Doonesbury or what's your opinion on this general topic? I read Doonesbury like every day along with pearls before swine and shoe. Okay, you don't have to list them all. It's like 18,000, right? But so what's your opinion? (laughs) I don't see anything wrong with it, but there's got to be someone who Do you think it's political satire that it would belong on the editorial page then and not in the section with all of the other comics? I would probably say just put it on the regular page with the rest of the comics. There you go. Gene, what do you think? Well, it all depends. I mean, if you've got a lot of uh, young people reading it, uh, it may be um, to their advantage of putting it up on the uh, website versus in the paper itself. But, I mean, depending on the content, uh, I don't see anything wrong with it per se. It's just it's just a, um, you know, a thing that it's Personal something that's yeah. uh, preferred, I guess. So. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it all depends on the content of what you would do with that particular comic. To, to kind of go underneath it for a minute, if that's okay with you guys, to get to get serious, it, what Trudeau's trying to bring, I think what he's trying to do is point out that there's, there's this new Texas law where a woman and in, in, I mean, abortion is legal, you know, across the country. And she has but, to be made to watch the video of the yes. ultrasound, too. Yeah, I so was reading that article. Just, right. right, going into get saying into a, a place, a clinic, a doctor's office where she, they want, she wants to get an abortion. This new Texas law will, she has to have a sonogram or, you know, ultrasound, whatever you want us to call it. And she has to watch And, the and watch and see the heartbeat and, or hear the fetal heartbeat and, she, and see the image of the fetus so that... I guess I guess the legislators want you know that chance to try to sway 
sway them in a different direction than maybe, which seems, well, it seems, that seems a little bit outrageous um, to require someone to do that before they, you know, but, but maybe, maybe it's not outrageous. I don't know. I'm sort of mixed on it. I don't want to go too far into, <laughs> get too serious, but, you know, so Trudeau's really like, he's, he's going out there and he's, because it sounds, it, it seems like a pretty graphic version of Doonesbury here and uh, I'm not up on Doonesbury but this yeah this neither am I now uh, from Larry or Fred do you know if uh, what's Trudeau's point on this is he does he seem to be pro or con with this law then what's the gist well, of the comic well the comic the comic strip features a woman who goes into an abortion clinic and is confronted by several people who suggest she should be ashamed. Among them is a doctor who reads a script on behalf of Texas Governor Rick Perry, welcoming her to a compulsory transvaginal exam, and a middle-aged legislator who calls her a slut. One panel equates... Excuse me, does he say, oops? No, he no. Didn't Oh, say wrong show. One I'm panel, sorry. I thought, I thought this was a viewpoint. Is he sorry. dressed like Rush Limbaugh when he says that? I don't know, but <laughs> one, one panel equates the invasive procedure to rape and describes the device being proven as a 10-inch shame, shaming wand. So it sounds now, like he's pro, uh, he's pro law. I think he's pro choice. No, the Trudeau is, is anti law yeah. and pro choice. Oh, you think? Okay. Oh, well, I, I, we all know this. Now, what happened is when asked for a comment on a Doonesbury uh, series, Governor Perry's spokeswoman, Kathleen Fraser, said that the governor was proud of his leadership in the sonogram law. The decision to end life is not funny, Fraser said. This is a not a this is a nothing comic about the tasteless inter inter interpretation of legislation we have passed in Texas to ensure that a woman have all the facts when making a, an ending life decision. Susan Roush, managing editor of Universal's You Click Syndicate, as newspapers are uncomfortable with the uh, abortion law series, have had... Have Jill, I'm with you. I'm, I'm on the fence with this. I, I want to say this is going a little bit against my beliefs of, uh, you know, the smaller government, states' rights, all of this kind of thing. And mm -hmm. does the government need to be sticking its nose into this and saying, you know, if you're going to get an abortion, you have to watch these, you know, live videos and everything of the fetus. It's it's just, and but yet I could almost see the other side. So that's why I'm saying I am on the fence with it. But I think I lean towards the, my beliefs of... Um, you know, smaller government, and I don't think the government has a right to get involved in this. Well, I think what it is is it's well. So Trudeau, I think, is a kind of you know traditionally a very left wing guy, liberal yeah, guy, and right. and but he and this is how it you know I it does seem like in my opinion appropriate for him to have yes. a you know be able to express himself, but maybe not put it in the regular comic page if it's going to be this graphic. But yeah, so he seems like he's he's kind of poking fun at how ridiculous. That, that law might be. It seems that other states have also enacted laws requiring pre abortion ultrasounds. So is, Texas is not the only one. Well, it looks like the direction it's going in then. I, I mean, it goes right along with today's, you know, politics and the, the Republican campaign. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just all, it's interesting. It's almost a counter, they're calling it a sexual counter revolution. It's like, it's just, you know, it's, it's just, it's fascinating to me because it's got. I guess because it has, it seems to have a lot of steam from different places in the country, and you know, just this the the uh, the idea of uh, I don't know the idea of with the with the Christian, you know, the the the, the idea that that social and moral social and moral uh, rules more rules need to be enacted, which does seem to go against less government to me. Yes, mm -hmm. I agree with that. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, speaking of running out of steam, before we run this uh, topic out of steam, into the ground. What else? What else do we have? It was, was a very good. Uh, that that was great, though. I'm glad that uh, you came up with that topic. That was uh, certainly worth talking about, and that might be something for another one of our podcasts. Hint, hint, to uh, pick up as a storyline. It might be look uh, worth looking into. So I what, think we should. Yes. So what do we have next? Well, we have continuing on our crusade of how dumb are people. A New York City woman who climbed into a clothing box drop after, uh, suffocated and died inside after a box metal door closed on her head and trapped her Saturday, uh, last Saturday. This is great. Melissa Mazio. It's not one, great for her. <laughs> she crawled into a large metal box on Staten Island about noon time local, uh, noon local time in an apparent attempt to steal donated clothing. Well, a box ate her. So... <laughs> You don't steal clothing from whoever it is, but this is great. I mean, this is this comes right out of True TV's Dumbest Criminals. I'm telling you. 
Okay, Jill, you can stop laughing now. <laughs> I, mean, I I just like the way you phrased that, the box ate her. <laughs> I did. It sounds like the door swung sh shut on her head <laughs> as she tried to climb out. I can't believe this is re an actual story. I mean, but it's from the Pocono <laughs> record, right? It's they're not. They're uh, not I mean, I mean, I tell you, no, you know, Fred brought up True TV. You watch, you know, some of these things on True TV, and they are actual episodes. It, it's amazing, you know, that they call it world's dumbest for a reason. Some of these people are just so dumb. I mean, the funny okay. part about boxes sits on Victory Boulevard near Clove Road, and her body was still inside. Now, she lived a few blocks from where she died, but she climbed in. Box hit her in the head. I mean, not for why nothing, not just but... Why not just walk into the Salvation Army or the the good, the, you know, the, the free goods store or something and get your donated clothing that way? I don't think she wanted to pay for them. <laughs> Even... Just to show you that crime don't pay. <laughs> yeah, that's the lesson today for all the kids listening. <laughs> and, and also the other lesson is that even though starfish don't have a brain, they are smarter than many humans. <laughs> yeah, the thing is, is, the thing is that this kind, this kind of stuff, though, goes on. And I mean, there have been homeless people who have been found living in these boxes. They've been oh, found yeah. stealing the clothes out of the boxes. I mean, if you've had desperate for clothing, for Christ's sake, you know, get somebody give this guy, uh, give this woman some clothing. But, but this comes kind of actually, it's a cooperation with the New York Post. But I mean, she died after getting trapped mm -hmm. inside of a clothing drop box. I mean, how do you, how, I mean, how do you write that up? Unbelievable. I mean, I, this is terrible. I, 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 very bad taste. But maybe she, maybe she saw someone putting something in there. It was really high end. Yeah, like, that she really uh, wanted. Like a Chanel, a mm -hmm. Chanel handbag. <laughs> yep. Oh, yeah, I have to have that coach bag. Yeah, yeah, and she had to get it before anybody else. We can yeah. just file this under the fickle finger of fate. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Guess the okay. box did eat her. What do we have next? <laughs> dumb, 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 dumb people. What I found interesting, I read an article and I figured I'd share it with people. It comes out of, actually, it was written for last week's show, but I figured I'd share it. NASA spacecraft, believe it, has detected oxygen around one of Saturn's icy moons known as Dion. The discovery supports the theory that suggests that all of the moons near Saturn and Jupiter may have have oxygen around them. If they have oxygen, it creates an atmosphere and possibly water. And water, of course, leads to the very the very uh, beginnings of life, possibly, which means there could be possibly life on other places in space. I love these kind of stories because it's showing that not only are we the ones that have air and water, but they do exist in other planet, uh, other locations with you know, planets and moons throughout the solar system. Yeah, I think it's fascinating, actually. Again, I used to do, I used to dabble in a little science way back. And um, <laughs> I think I've always thought about when you stop and you get that, that perspective of, Okay, so here we are, and we think that you know our we think our our town or city, never mind our planet, is sort of the center of the universe, right? Like we all kind of look at where we are and say, okay, well this is what's important, this is what's going on for me. But when you really back up and you think, okay, so this here we are on Earth, and that's we are on one planet of nine in our solar system, and our solar system is just isn't it, isn't it eight now? Well, it depends it, it, if you want to include Pluto, Pluto or yeah. not, right? Pluto got didn't, they deep, didn't they deep planted they, Pluto? They depluted Pluto. They depluted Pluto. They demoted Pluto. They did. So you're right. You're right, Fred. There's eight. But that, our, that solar system of ours is only one, whatever, one, one, one millionth. Or, you know, I, I don't even have the perspective of how how much they know they think is out there. And so there's just so many other galaxies that are, and so to think that, of course, there's got to be. It's only I think it's only a matter of time, right? That we're going to find life somewhere else, and that it really is. It's it's not just a matter of time. Meaning more and more years, you know, go by where they discover more stuff and science. But it's also a matter of time because to get information from Saturn and Jupiter, it takes like two or three years for a NASA spacecraft to get there from here. It's a long trip. My grandfather was a polymer chemist for Cebagayi back in the 1930s. He used to tell me that as a thinking human being, a scientist, he says it's inconceivable that there's life on one planet in the vastness of the universe. Right. And if there's one, there has to be two. 
If there's two, there's four. If there's four, there's 400,000. We just haven't found them yet. I mean, in the vastness of space, there's only one. That makes no sense to him or me. But mm -hmm. according, to, according to a guy... Yeah, we, we have talked about this before because me and Holly were talking about the movie... Uh, Contact. Contact, you know, where that's the main point of that movie. You know, in, in something this big, we can't possibly be the only thing out here. And right. they, according to a uh, gentleman by the name of Andrew Coates at the University College of London, Dion has no liquid water, so it does not have the conditions to support life, but it is possible that other moons around Jupiter and Saturn may. Apparently, discoveries made by the Cassini spacecraft flew by Dion nearly two years ago. Instruments on board on the unmanned probe detect a thin layer of oxygen around the moon. I think that's great. If it's oxygen, then we can, you know, depending on how much there is, it could support life in other ways. So, you know, water, and, I mean, it, it's a great idea, the possibility of us finding it. I mean, I have no doubt in my mind that we people have been here before. We've been visited and all this good stuff. There, there, there's, there's almost irrefutable proof for that only we haven't found them because they're too smart to get involved with us huh that could be true i mean uh, think about this if they came down here the first thing we want to do is dissect them. they want to come down and yeah and i don't have a problem with them. You know, no wonder they come in abduct you do some stuff and put you back you stop it you know it's not gonna be like et where the kid where the guy's riding the bicycle they're gonna try and dissect these guys to find out what makes them tick right so this the professor that you mentioned at the the college in London is there's a, he's a, a, among a group of scientists lobbying the European Space Agency, which is a, it's about time they get involved, <laughs> put, putting up some money to send things, you know, get people in space or get probes out there. But they want to send an orbiter to explore all of Jupiter's moons because there's I guess there's one just, I think one in particular yeah. they really think is suitable for life has an ocean yeah. Right. So they, I guess, if they send out this orbiter to explore the, it says to explore Jupiter. I think Jupiter's that's, I think that's Io, isn't it? It's known as the Juice Mission. <laughs> isn't Io? Isn't Io the one with the war? With the yeah, I think so. Underneath the ice. Yeah. So that means that Saturn and Jupiter, which maybe, re oxygen is released. Like there, there's oxygen being released from their their satellite moons. So that's yeah, that's very promising. Like you said. Friends. And that's only right here close to home in our, not only our own solar system, but within a couple planets from us. Right. So, you know, you expand that on like what Fred was saying and Jodie Foster in contact. You know, if space literally goes on virtually endlessly, how, how could how could we be the only thing and, out there? Uh, it said the Dion sister moon... And Cladius is all, it's thought to harbor a liquid ocean below its icy surface. The same is thought of Europa, Callisto, and Ganymede. Now, it's one what an Io, uh, which, which, which one, or some of the moons that orbit Jupiter. And remember that Saturn and Jupiter are gas planets. They're not rock planets like we are, but their moons are. A lot, you know, their moons can be almost bigger than our planet, but... You know, if if the moons themselves have an ocean have an ocean of water and an atmosphere of some kind, it is possible for life to be there. They would be they would be surround they circling their sun or the you know, Jupiter would say being the equivalent of their sun to ours. So it, it's possible. I think so. I think it's it's exciting, and I think it's just scratching the surface of the information and what's out there. And I I, I think it really like the time it it said it took two years. Right, the article said it took two years for this. For them to for it to travel from here to that to Jupiter to the moon of Jupiter, so it's just a long. It's there's a lot of space out there in space. Sure is, and that's <laughs> close by. Where are you? We need you. The daylight savings time started last night at 2 a.m. Yes, it did. I should say early this morning at 2 a.m. And so there's there's a definitely controversy and questions about whether daylight saving saving time actually saves energy, which is what it was proposed to do back during World War One. So World War One, it was adopted first uh, overseas, Germany, Russia, and England. And then uh, the idea was to conserve coal for because of the war going on. They needed the coal for the war effort. So they, if they could just stretch out the daylight during spring and summer, then they use less electricity for lighting, right? And they'd have that, they'd be able to conserve and use that for the, for the war effort. But I guess there's a there's a whole slew of studies on the subject, and the one that I found to be the most oh I should say the most uh, it's not stable but you know the most interesting really is that you may be saving light energy from lights in your house, lighting, but 
really you're cranking up the air conditioner in a lot of parts of the U.S. because it is not going to dusk. It's an hour later, so therefore people have that uh, ox- that air conditioning turned up higher, you know, turned up, to, or I should say, turned cooler, and they're using more energy for that. Yeah. So it really it ends up being a wash or. You know. Perfect, and we do have Gene in Los Angeles, and Los Angeles isn't known for being as moderately tempered as, say, San Francisco or Boston or something as it is. So, yeah, Gene, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Well, as far as Los Angeles, it's been really nuts as far as weather. Hmm. One day it'll be uh, 85 degrees, and then the next oh. day it'll be like 20 <laughs> or 25, 25 degrees cooler. You know, so there's no consistency of whether you're going to use your air conditioning or your heat. Hmm. And so, you know, what Jill said, it's true. I mean, uh, you're not really saving the money on the uh, No, because if, if it stays yeah. light later, that means the heat index is going to be around later in the day, which means theoretically you might have your AC on longer. Exactly, oh. exactly. So you're not really saving any money with daylight savings time. And- Daylight saving time for a lot of areas, a lot of rural areas, was done so that there were more time for the kids to work in the field during the summertime. That's why we the summer's off from school. Right. But what's happening what's happening now is that the kids are going to school in the dark, getting the bus in the dark, coming home in the afternoon with more time to do whatever they want to in the afternoon. And you know, there are some parts of the country that do not change their clocks back. Arizona being one, they so they're they're two hours ahead or three hours ahead depending upon when you when you are in the country and where you are in the country. And uh, there's Arizona some, and Hawaii. Right. That's right. And there's some yeah. negative uh, implications to this uh, medical wise too, right? They're saying yeah, they, well, they talk about increasing traffic fatalities. Again, I read through the studies. The one that, about the air conditioning and the actual energy savings or lack of energy savings was the most, you know, I felt, the, the, the best argument against right. daylight savings time. But the, sure. the one about the traffic fatalities is that more people are driving when it's light out than starting, you know, starting now March and, and April. And so and so that's more, better, safer when it's light out when versus light. driving in the dark. But because of losing the hour of sleep, the sleep disrupt- disruption apparently it shows a bump up in traffic fatalities okay. the day or two, a couple days after the actual change. So that would mean today, tomorrow. I can't imagine that that's really an argument against No, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think the best argument is that if, like Gene said, if it's getting dark later in the day, you're going to run your air conditioning more as opposed to your lights. And as any body would realize an air conditioner uses a lot more electricity than a light bulb does so where's your savings and you know, you're not saying i mean when when uh, when it was originally uh, thought of we weren't running air conditioning the way we are no and right you know so yeah. you know and that's one of the reasons why they're also talking about the fact that it can be bad for your health i mean there's mixed studies about that one comes out of the uh, uni- the uh, journal of applied psychology uh a 2009 study found that Tired workers are are at greater risk of worse place mm-hmm. accidents, and that when the people change their clocks, it can, it can actually uh, cause. But see, I uh, agree with Jill, death. though. I don't know how long term that affects that you, is. because okay, you know, today I had to get up an hour earlier or an hour later, however, whichever way Let's you look at it. So um, you know, big deal. So in a day or two, your body's going to adjust for that. Yeah. So I don't see how exactly. there's any long term effects to the yeah. hour difference. Again, My, again, you I, know. We already Reggie? know by the studies are being sold. I think personally, they should just leave it. Leave it the Eastern, the Eastern, or yeah, whatever exactly. the standard you time, rather. Change, you know, take yeah. one or the other and leave it. Yeah, and exactly. and I say leave it. It's just regular standard time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, it, there's no. I mean, it gets dark now. What nine thirty night in the summer? I mean, so it gets dark at eight thirty. Yeah. So what? Right. I mean, you know, deal. who cares? And and again, like. Mine and Jill's argument is if it gets dark at 8.30 as opposed to 9.30, the nights are going to cool down a little earlier and you're going to start saving on air conditioning. So, exactly. I, I, you know, you, would have you might actually save money if you just leave it on standard time. I'd like to find out why the other three states don't change or why they, why they Arizona why specifically. They yeah, I would like to know, too. That's uh, that's a good uh, that's. Uh, the That'll be a good homework assignment. Yeah. There's, homework. there's the homework for next week. For our listeners, maybe someone can write, make a comment, write in and let us know about Arizona. <laughs> there you go. And you could write those comments, and you could write those comments into awsi at basenettv.com, awsi at basenettv.com. 
And while we're on that topic, if anybody doesn't know how to follow us on social media, on Google+, Plus, just look for BaseNet TV, on Twitter, BaseNet TV, on Facebook, BaseNet. Almost all of the individual hosts and co-hosts have their uh, accounts on all of the different social media sites, so just search for any of them. You could contact this show at awsi at basenettv.com or write for any other basenet programming at info at basenetintermedia.com. Finally, I guess the best place to look for all of our programming would be right on our own website, which is, you guessed it, basenettv.com. And while you are at that location, basenettv.com, you can tell we're trying to drill that into your psyche. <laughs> there is a tab up at the top for donations. We accept donations for as little as a dollar. And these are all one-time charges. They're not recurring. We won't automatically rebill you. So you could donate once every six years if you choose to. But you could donate for as little as one dollar. And those donations are highly appreciated because it helps with the expenses of keeping all of our programming running. And... If you donate $20 or more, you will be named as an executive producer on the show of the week you make your donation. So go ahead and make a donation at that donation tab at basenettv.com anytime this week. And on next week's show, you will become an executive producer and you will so be named on the show. Barring any other topics of discussion for today... I guess we'll just about wrap up show number 33 of As We See It from March 11th, 2012. In Boston, Massachusetts, I'm Ed Jupin. From the Pocono Mountains of Pennsylvania, I'm Fred Boas. From the Suburgatory in Norfolk, Massachusetts, I'm Jill Hindley. And from Brooklyn, Massachusetts, I'm the Lobster. And from Los Angeles, California, I'm Gene White. We thank you for listening this week and join us next week for another as we see it right here on Basenet Internet Television.